What I'd like to do is introduce our next speaker, Charles Goyette, is the author of the New York Times best-selling book, The, the Dollar Meltdown. Surviving the impending, uh, impending currency crisis with gold, oil, and other unconventional investments, which Congressman Ron Paul calls a must-read. And investor Peter Schiff describes as a sensible plan to protect your investments. He formerly hosted talk show, uh, uh, radio talk shows here in Arizona on KTAR, KFYI, KXXP, KFNX, and he's also been a participant in both political and financial debates on Fox News, CNN, MSNBC, PBS, and CNBC. Please give a warm welcome for Charles Goya. Ah, uh, friends everywhere. They got all these people that love liberty, huh? Radicals. <laughs> so, isn't the Bill of Rights this wonderful, beautifully balanced document? If you think about it, it's perfectly bookended because it starts out with the five most beautiful words in the English language Congress shall make no law. <laughs> It ends with the Tenth Amendment. My, uh, my friend passed away this year, Joe Sobert, great political writer, uh, senior editor of National Review for a long time, commentator on, on CBS. He was an early, he's been an advocate for uh, many, many years of, uh, of the Tenth Amendment, constantly trying to call people's attention to what it uh, represented. It was a great wit. And he said, one would suppose from uh, the, the suppression of the Tenth Amendment that the Supreme Court had uh, banned it from appearing in public places. And that, I, in my case, I thought it was actually because of the Patriot Act. You know, they just outlawed the Tenth Amendment. We're not, not able to look at it. But listen, I want to talk to you about uh, the, the economic calamity that we are uh, just beginning and that will unfold over the course of the next couple of years and how these things typically Unfold. This is very important uh, to understand. You may have watched the uh, the the, uh, the, the uh, problems that are going on in Egypt right now. You know, this had an economic uh, beginning. I mean, in Tunisia, it started with food riots. Why were there food riots? Money printing by the Federal Reserve, by the European Central Bank, money printing by uh, by Japan, money printing by. The International Monetary Fund, money printing, money printing, money printing, and it has begun to show up in commodity prices throughout the economy. This started events in Tunisia, which has led to Egypt. So I want to talk to you about what may happen, the kinds of things that you will see in a monetary crisis here in the United States. Um, the, the dollar debt express that I have written about in the, uh, in the dollar meltdown really rides on two rails. It rides on fiscal rail. This is the activity of the, uh, the Congress, the President, the money that they spend, the money that they raise in taxes, and so on. And then there's the monetary rail. And that's the activities of the Federal Reserve. So I'd like to take a minute and tell you where I see these two rails headed as uh, we approach the precipice of a real calamity in this country. So you can judge for yourself how this thing uh, is likely to unfold. And I'll try to finish, if I have time, with what the government, what governments typically do in the face of the currency crisis such as they have created for us. First of all, I think we're going to talk about the uh, fiscal crisis. We need to look at the new Congress and its promises, lack of promises, and so on. Um, before the election in September, John Boehner, the new Speaker of the House, said, hey, if you elect us, this is what we will do. It was supposed to be like the contract with America from 94. It was called the Pledge to America or something. In September, he said, if you elect us, we will cut $100 billion from next year's spending. And I, I looked at that and I laughed and I thought, surely this is a comedy act. $100 billion. So here's what you can do. You can go to the U.S. Treasury website. They have the debt to the penny every day on the Treasury. This is the visible debt, you know, the debt that's acknowledged at $14.2 trillion. Not the un unfunded liabilities, just the visible debt, 14 point. So I said, okay, well, let's, they're going to cut $100 billion in the first year. They made that announcement on September 22nd or 23rd, so I thought, okay, let's bookmark this and see how long it takes 
or the debt to rise by $100 billion, and then we'll see just how serious this pledge was. Ladies and gentlemen, one week, by September 30th, the visible portion of the national debt had risen by $100 billion. So you know these people, these people aren't serious. And if you look at, for example, fine, old, line, conservative, think tank, the Heritage Foundation, they said, no, here's, here's what we suggest. Over the next couple of years, we can cut 350, 340, some billion dollars. And I looked through it. They did not touch the American empire. They did not touch any of it. So you have this country spends a trillion dollars a year on war, foreign aid, foreign spending, when Hillary Clinton's out trying to steal people's frequent flyer miles. You know, when, when, when Hillary is trying to get dirt, uh, if you read between the lines, she's trying to get the dirt, she's trying to find out something about the president of some South, South American country's sex life. I got interviewed by Lou Rockwell the other day, I said, why didn't she just hire Linda Tripp to do that? <laughs> she's experienced at it. But all of this costs money, and it's a trillion dollars a year. But they don't, they don't want to touch that. So what is the most realistic plan so far is Rand Paul the other day. And Rand Paul said, well, uh, I'm going to propose that we cut $500 billion. Ladies and gentlemen, they just announced that for the current year, the deficit for the current year is going to come in at one and a half trillion. So if they even, if, if by some unbelievable act of... Uh, of uh, your wildest fantasy, they were able to cut $500 billion, it would lower the, the annual deficit to $1 trillion. I mean, it's simply, it's simply out of control. Now, none of this could possibly have happened had we abided by the Tenth Amendment. That brings us to the Constitution, that they made a big deal about reading the Constitution in the new Congress a couple of weeks ago when they convened. And I know a lot of people here probably found that you know, helpful. They thought, you know, well, at least they're trying to call attention to the Constitution. I was very dismayed about this. Because this is the syndrome of modern American life. Everything is a substitute for something real. Um, if you look at American coinage from the beginning of America, the coins portrayed the figure of liberty. And now liberty barely appears, but it's all politicians. Ideal, the ideal, the enduring Ideal was liberty. That's what America came together about. And that's been replaced on our coinage now and in its place of politicians. In the, in the case of our monetary system, we used to have a gold-backed monetary system, gold-based money, and, and yet that's disappeared now, and you get paper money, which is redeemable in nothing. And so when they read the Constitution, this is the same thing. This is words, not deeds. And so I find it dismaying to see them do that. And as soon, as, as, soon as, it was, as it was over, they went back to arguing about how they're going to continue to do all these unconstitutional things that they're not allowed to do. So I thought, I thought of the, uh, the, the Christian admonition for the hypocrites that love to pray in the streets to be seen of men. And they're advised to go take themselves into their closets and shut the door. And, and I wish they had done that. I mean, you had, a couple of days ago, you had John Lewis, who's been in Congress for 25 years, and a news guy stuck a microphone in his face and he said, what is the constitutional justification for Obamacare? He said, oh, the pursuit of happiness clause. <laughs> so, but 